This video lecture is going to be over chapter 6. We're going to be discussing hormones and the endocrine system. This lecture is going to correspond to your chapter 6 study guide that better outlines all of the individual sections in chapter 6 that I expect you guys to have kind of read and looked through and in the content material and learning objectives that you'll be responsible for um, with this set of material. In addition, you can find these PowerPoint slides posted on Canvas. So let's start first with what are hormones? So a hormone is a molecule that is utilized for cell-to-cell -cell communication. Uh, generally by definition, hormones, they're going to be chemical signals that get secreted by either a single cell or a group of cells and they are transported by blood. That distinguishes say, a hormone from a neurotransmitter that does not get transported by the blood. The, because there is systemic circulation, that uh, effect um, that they, they have is on target tissues that are generally very distant from the cells that secrete it. So we're not talking about paracrine or autocrine signaling, we're talking about long distance signaling. And those target tissues will have receptors that bind to those specific hormones. And by definition, a hormone has to be this chemical system or signal, it's secreted, transported, and then it activates a physiological response, and this is important, at low concentrations. You should not have to have a high concentration of a hormone to initiate a response. What do they do? Uh, well, there's a couple things they do. One, they're going to control the rates of enzymatic reactions. Second, they can control the transport of ions or molecules across cell membranes. So when they bind to receptors, they can actually cause that membrane um, to become more permeable. Uh, they can activate carrier-mediated proteins to then transport um, substances across. Like in the case of insulin, insulin is a hormone. When it binds to receptors on target tissues, it will activate GLUT4 and GLUT2 transporters. And lastly, they can control the gene expression and synthesis of proteins. So they can actually tell cells, let's start producing this, this particular protein. How do they work? Uh, well, uh, they have what we call a cellular mechanism of action. So once they bind to a receptor, and it's going to depend on what type of receptor they bind to, uh, that will initiate a biochemical response on the cellular level. So it may, again, open up um, cell-mediated proteins for membrane transport. It could initiate uh, transcription translation. It could uh, initiate some enzymatic reactions. Okay, but those all happen within the cell. And we call that the cellular mechanism. Each hormone also has a half-life. The half-life indicates the length of its activity. So that molecule will start to degrade and generally uh, we, we dictate the half-life by when we have a concentration of, of hormone when it becomes 50% of its um, initial concentration the length of time that's its half-life. Uh, there's a number of hormones uh, that we'll be talking about this semester. We're not going to talk about them all in this chapter. A lot of students say, hey, endocrinology is really important and it seems like we only spend one one lecture on it. Uh, not true. When we talk about cardiovascular system, when we talk about respiratory, gastrointestinal reproduction, all of those we will be talking about both neural um, activity and endocrine activity because those are our reflex pathways. But uh, just as a, a superficial overview, I'm not going to necessarily test on these per se, but these should you should be familiar with these different glands and uh, some of the hormones that, that we'll be talking about. So we have the penile gland that produces uh, melatonin. Uh, we then have our hypothalamus. We'll be talking a lot about the hypothalamus that produces all of our trophic hormones. Um, then we have posterior pituitary and the anterior pituitary. We'll talk today about what hormones are found there. Our thyroid gland is an endocrine gland. It produces our thyroxine, um, calcitonin, uh, we have the parathyroid, thalamus, the heart 
is an endocrine gland. It produces uh, the hormone atrial uh, neuretic peptide, or ANP. That's important for sodium uh, excretion. We have the liver, stomach, pancreas, adrenal cortex, adrenal medulla. Uh, the kidney itself does produce erythropoietin, which acts as a hormone. Our skin is considered an endocrine gland. It produces vitamin D, um, and that has a, a hormone uh, function. The, the testes or the ovaries in a female. Uh, fat tissue, so adipose tissue, can act as an endocrine gland. It produces leptin, um, resistin, some a few other things. And then in a female during pregnancy, the placenta acts as an endocrine gland. So again, I'm not going to necessarily test over these, but, but recognize um, we will be talking a lot about these throughout this throughout the uh, semester, and and uh, it's it's a good idea to kind of familiarize yourself with them. Certainly, if you take an anatomy, you should know where all these are located. Okay. How do we classify our our hormones? There's three main types of hormones. We have peptide, or sometimes called protein hormones, steroid hormones, and then our amino acid derived hormones, or sometimes we call those the amine hormones. Uh, this classification is based off of how they are, um, their structure, how they're made. So let's talk about our peptide or protein hormones first. So a peptide or protein hormone is is just a protein, right? It's a it's a peptide, polypeptide that gets that's made and it acts as a hormone in that it can bind to receptors. Okay, so we have lots of different types. Uh, what I do want you to be familiar with is is how these are made in the different stages. Of production of a peptide uh, protein. So peptides, you may remember from biology 112 or even from your high school biology, uh, peptides are made in the cytoplasm by ribosomes and they utilize mRNA. So our genes get transcribed into mRNA molecules. Those mRNAs then get translated by a protein into, um, or sorry, translated by a ribosome into a protein. And what we produce first is what we call a pre-pro hormone. It's a very large peptide and it's inactive in this stage. And the reason why it's inactive is it has um, a signal sequence still on there uh, and there's a few um, uh, what we call these um, thyrotropin releasing hormones that are that can or that are found interspace between the, the peptide, okay, these other peptide fragments. So large, it's inactive. Once it's, it's a, uh, it first gets made as a pre-pro hormone and then it'll move into the, uh, the, the rough ER and, and it gets transported to the Golgi apparatus. It gets put into a transport uh, vesicle and we cleave off that signal sequence. So that's basically, it's its ticket to ride, that sequence, signal sequence. It tells it, hey, this needs to be go to the Golgi apparatus and it needs to be processed further. So we cleave that off. Um, it becomes a pro-hormone, okay? And it's, we call it protolytic in the sense that we're still gonna cleave um, an aspect of it off, okay? What we cleave off is another peptide fragment that gets pulled off and that actually occurs once we package the uh, the protein in a secretory vesicle for exocytosis. So we've gone through the Golgi apparatus, we put it in a vesicle, and we we now have an active hormone that is in that. And when that cell gets triggered, when that endocrine cell gets triggered to release that hormone, um, that vesicle will fuse with the cell membrane, and we will release the peptide hormone into the ECF, it'll diffuse into the, uh, into the blood, and it'll be circulated in the blood to the target tissues. Okay, so the sequence is pre-pro hormone, find that in the rough ER, uh, pro hormone when it gets packaged into a transport vesicle, and then the Golgi apparatus, we, we turn it into its peptide hormone in the secretory vesicle. Now the function of a hormone, its cellular mechanism. Uh, pro peptide hormones, they cannot enter their target cells, right? They're not gonna be able to diffuse across the membrane. So what they do is they're going to 
uh, bind to receptors, and those receptors then are going to trigger secondary or second messenger systems, right? So we're now going to, we have that transduction in which we initiate a secondary messenger system um, and it's going to have a cellular response. In some cases that may be opening um, a gated channel, right? So it could bind, open a gated channel and we'll have ions move across. Or it goes through the secondary messenger pathway and we have a different cellular response, like maybe it, it initiates translation of a, dish, uh, of a different gene, okay? But again, recognize they don't actually enter the cell. So now let's talk about steroid hormones. Okay, steroid hormones are derived from cholesterol. Okay, so cholesterol, here we can see it right here, it is a lipophilic molecule, meaning it, it is able to easily cross cell membranes. So all steroids are derived from cholesterol and they get turned into a couple precursors, right? It's either going to be um, turned into progesterone and then our progesterone has a couple of different pathways um, or it can be turned into an androstenedienine. Um, androstenedienine usually gets converted into testosterone and then testosterone can get converted into estradiol, or in other cases we can we can get to estradiol through their andros, uh, or androstenedione. So these are going to be our, our sex androgens or sex steroids, testosterone or testosterone and estrogen. Uh, we can also take uh, proge uh, progesterone and convert it into uh, essentially cortisol or aldosterone. So our, our three main, or I should say our four main um, steroids are going to be aldosterone, okay, that gets made primarily in the adrenal cortex. Uh, cortisol gets made in the adrenal cortex. Um, estradiol, which gets made in the ovary, um, or our, our testosterone, our dihydrotestosterone, which gets made um, in the testes or in the ovary. In order for a steroid to be transported in the blood, unlike say a peptide hormone that just uh, diffuses into the bloodstream, uh, these have to bind to carrier proteins in the blood. So they bind to an extra carrier protein that then carries it through the blood and because it does this it actually has a longer half-life than our other hormones because it's bound up and it's not easily degraded. So they, they last longer, they have longer half-lives. Their cellular mechanism of, of action, well because they are lipophilic, most of our steroids are going to diffuse across the cell membrane. Okay, so they'll actually enter the cell. There is some recent um, studies that actually show there are a few surface receptors uh, that they can bind to and they initiate a rapid response. Uh, but th that's that's traditionally not the main pathway. The main pathway is they're going to diffuse across and then they can either bind to say a cytoplasmic receptor protein and initiate some type of response. This usually helps it enter. But most of what the, our hormone steroids do is they have what we call genomic effects. They activate or repress genes for protein synthesis. Uh, so that means that they have to diffuse, either bind to a cytoplasmic receptor and go into the nucleus, or sometimes they'll, they'll go straight into the nucleus and then they'll bind to some type of um, some type of nuclear receptor like an activator um, or a repressor. And they either slow, they either slow uh, transcription or speed up transcription and, and make certain genes accessible. They'll, they'll help with that transcription. So there's a genomic expression that leads to a new protein um, being produced. Okay, a slower response. It does take time for all this diffusion to occur. It's not going to be as rapid as, as say our peptide hormones and the responses that they get. Our last hormones uh, class that we want to talk about are, are amino acid derived or what we call the amine hormones. 
and all amine hormones, they come from one of two amino acids, either tryptophan or tyrosine. And the, the main ones that I want to focus on are, are the ones that are derived from tyrosine. So we can see tyrosine right here, and there's two main classes of amine hormones that are made from tyrosine. Uh, we get what are called our catecholamines. Okay, the catecholamines uh, we'll talk about a lot when we get into our neurons next week. Uh, but these are epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine. No, I don't need you to identify these by um, their their molecular structure here, uh, but I do want you to know that dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine are catecholamines. Um, the other type of tyrosine derived amines, uh, hormones are going to be our thyroid hormones. And so you can see here um, our thyroid hormones ha are either thyroxine, sometimes we, we abbreviate it as T4, it's a tetra um, idiothyronine, so there's iodine that gets attached onto these. Um, that's really, iodine is very important in our thyroid hormones. Um, or triidiothyronine, uh, or T3. So T4 and T3 are our thyroid hormones. I love, love, love this table. This is a great synopsis table from your book, 7.1. It goes through and it just basically outlines what are the differences between these things. So we see our peptide hormones, our steroid hormones, and then our amine, our tyrosine derivative ones, the catecholamines and thyroids. And so we can see um, where, how they're made and stored, right? Um, how they're released from the cell, most of them are going to be exocytosis. Steroids are going to be released by simple diffusion and our thyroid hormones will be by simple diffusion. Um, how they're transported, so you'll see our peptides are dissolved in the plasma, our catecholamines are dissolved in the plasma, but our steroid hormones and our thyroid hormones have to be bound to carrier proteins. Uh, the ones that are bound to carrier proteins have longer half-lives, the ones that aren't are shorter. Um, their location of the receptor cell membrane, cell membrane, and the steroid hormones and the thyroid hormones are again going to most, are going to usually be um, in the nucleus or cytoplasm, right? These, you can kind of think the steroids and the thyroid are very, very similar. They're derived from different things. This is from a cholesterol and this one's um, derived from uh, tyrosine, but still, similar function. Uh, what do they do when they bind their, their receptors? Uh, the general response, this is going to be modification of proteins, induction of new protein synthesis for peptides, um, and, and they give you some examples. So great table to kind of keep these in, uh, in check to know which is, what are the differences between these. Yeah, I can pull questions from this. So what controls hormone release? Well, let's, let's look at just what we call a simple reflex control, in which we, the endocrine cell directly senses the stimulus and it responds. Okay, we're not doing something a little bit more complex where we have a neural signal in there, but let's just say um, we're looking at a, in this case, um, a parathyroid hormone in which it's getting stimulated by the concentration of, of calcium in our blood. So when calcium is low in our blood plasma, the parathyroid cell is going to, that's the stimulus, right? The parathyroid cell is our, is our sensor. Uh, we don't really have this input signal per se, right? And we don't have an integration center because that all occurs right here in the endocrine uh, cell itself. But it makes a, it makes a decision that says, hey, our the concentration of plasma calcium is lower than what it should be let's release parathyroid hormone. That gets excreted, um, circulated in the blood, and it's gonna bind to receptors on cells in our bones and in our, in our kidneys. And in the bones, what it's gonna do is it's gonna increase bone reabsorption. So we're gonna start breaking down some of our bone to produce more calcium. Uh, in the kidneys, it's gonna increase the reabsorption of calcium. So we're gonna take more calcium back from the nephron and put it into the blood. Uh, and then it's also going to, in the uh, kidney, we're going to have these this production of 
um, what we call, um, oh, we're going to increase the intestinal absorption. We start producing these what we call calcitriol uh, leads that, are, that it have an effect in the intestine to absorb calcium in there as well from our diet. All that is going to go into the blood, which raises our blood calcium concentration. We have a negative feedback loop that once that gets higher than, than our set point, we stop this excretion, right? So this is, would be a simple reflex control of, um, of a hormone. We look at, let's look at another one. This is a little bit more complex, but let's take glucose now. Um, so plasma glucose levels is going to be regulated by um, the, the hormone insulin. But now this is more complex than a simple reflex control. Now we have uh, a number of different things that are triggering this. So first off, let's say we have a spike in blood glucose concentration. That's going to trigger the pancreas, specifically the alpha cells in the pancreas, to say that we need to release insulin. Right, the set point is, is increased, so insulin will get released, circulated. It's going to go to target tissues in our liver, muscle, adipose cell, and, and trigger glute transporters to uptake that glucose. And also, it's going to trigger cells to utilize the glucose, change it into glycogen. Okay, that'll help lower. However, at the same time, when we eat a meal, I, we have stretch receptors in our, in our digestive tract. They're going to in, feel that stretch. They're going to send a signal to the brain which then says, registers of, hey, our stomach is stretching, we have, uh, we've just eaten, we probably need to get ready for um, glucose utilization. And so it triggers the pancreas through a neuronal pathway to release that insulin. Likewise, as we start getting glucose in the, in the lumen of our intestinal tract, we have endocrine cells there in the small intestine that says, hey, look, there's glucose here. We haven't absorbed it yet, but it's here. They release uh, what we call glucagon-like uh, peptide 1, so GLP-1, and that triggers the pancreas to release insulin. So all of these different tracts are firing to release, that uh, to release the insulin, and then as we get the negative feedback, these will initially kind of get shut off. This time, let's talk about neurohormones. Um, our, our neurohormones are hormones that are going to be utilized by the uh, nervous system. And there is this pathway uh, that, that most of these hormones are released from. Okay, So three major groups. One comes from the adrenal medulla. This is in the kidney itself. Okay, the, the adrenal medulla is gonna is gonna produce all of our catecholamines, so our epinephrine, primarily, and norepinephrine. Okay, then in the brain we have this structure, right? It's found in the, our brain, um, in the brain stem, or or I should say anterior to the brain stem, um, is the hypothalamus, and the hypothalamus is going to trigger the neural hormones for our, that, that get released from the pituitary. So the pituitary sits immediately adjacent to the hypothalamus, right? It's found um, ventral. And you'll see that it has uh, two parts, well, the front being the anterior, the back being the posterior. And the posterior is made up of, of neuronal tissue. So this is neural tissue and the anterior is made up of endocrine cells, so it's an endocrine gland, a true endocrine gland. And between these, we have what we call a, a portal system. What a portal system is, is here we have blood that comes in through an artery, and then we have a, a specific capillary bed that then moves into veins, and it goes back to uh, the heart. And this portal system, it bays the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary with this blood. And, and we call it the hypothalamic hypophysial portal system. 
And what's great about this this portal this portal system is you'll remember that hormones they have effects in very low concentrations. And be, so now because we have this blood reservoir, uh, we can have hormones being secreted by the hypothalamus in very, very low concentrations that are immediately going to be detected in the anterior pituitary and have a huge effect because of the very low concentration. It's not being diluted by all of the blood. Yes, this will then move into the bloodstream and be further diluted. But with this portal system, we can have very quick responses with hormones, which normally hormones take a little bit more response, uh, more response time because they have to be circulated throughout the whole body. But when you have a portal system, very quick. Okay, um, we have three integrating centers in this. We have this integrating center that occurs in the hypothalamus, which which triggers a release of hormones. We call these trophic hormones because they trigger the release of hormones then in the anterior pituitary. So that's our second integrating center. And then generally we'll have a third one somewhere, you know, an additional endocrine gland, um, depending on what type of uh, hormone is being released. I do expect you guys to know the hormones found from the anterior and posterior pituitaries. The anterior pituitary, uh, it produces the um, following hormones. So prolactin comes from the anterior pituitary. We have a growth hormone thyroid stimulating hormone okay uh, we have our what we call our gonadotropin so our luteinizing hormone and uh, we also have our um, follicular stimulating hormone and then the last hormone we have um, gets produced um, it, it's triggered and then it, it um, acts on the adrenal cortex and that is our adrenocorticotropic hormone, or ACTH. The posterior pituitary, the two hormones that get produced are oxytocin and vasopressin, or sometimes we call that antidiuretic hormone. Now, these neurohormones, they have what we call a long loop negative feedback mechanism. So. Um, Depending on which hormones we're, we're talking about, uh, they first we have a, a stimulus that triggers the hypothalamus to release one of the tropic hormones. So um, it could release dopamine. Okay, dopamine is going to have an effect on on the production of prolactin, or it could produce um, our our thyroid releasing hormone TRH that's going to have an effect on the thyroid. Um, it could have our cortical releasing hormone. Okay, it could have a growth hormone, yeah, our growth hormone releasing hormone, or our gonadotropin releasing hormone. Okay, these are all trophic hormones that then move to the anterior pituitary and then will trigger the release of the next subset of hormones. Okay, so our trophic hormones too. Let's just take the thy the thyroid because you guys will be doing a case study on that. So we have thyroid releasing hormone being released by the hypothalamus and that triggers the release of thyroid stimulating hormone or TSH. That then is binds to receptors on the thyroid gland and it triggers the release of our thyroid hormone. So T3 and T4. Those hormones then bind to, re bind to receptors on all the tissues that have these and they have their effect of um, directing all the different pathways of the thyroid hormone has. You'll have a, a, a case study that talks about what some of those effects are of the thyroid hormones. And we have lots of, of negative feedback loops that then can occur. So we can have a negative feedback loop from, um, again, the hormone released in the case of our thyroid, so our T3. The T3 hormone, uh, as it gets released, as concentrations increase, it has a negative feedback loop both on the anterior pituitary and on the hypothalamus. Okay, um, so as these levels increase, it says, hey, don't produce any more TSH, don't produce any more TRH. Uh, we can also have what's called a short loop negative feedback, in which, in the case of the thyroid, TSH itself also has a negative feedback on TRH. So as TSH concentrations increase, 
it it triggers it binds to receptors on the hypothalamus and says stop producing the thyroid releasing hormone we, we don't we don't need any more of that okay so the thyrotropin releasing hormone goes uh, wait, we're stuck the case study that you will do this week is going to directly look at the thyroid and how we have these these um, these negative feedback loops by binding to receptors and basically blocking um, the other hormones from binding to those receptors. Lastly, let's talk about our hormone interaction. So hormones can interact with each other. We can have um, cases in which we have synergism in which the combined effects of multiple hormones is greater than the sum of their individual effects. So here we're just looking at blood glucose concentration, right? And what we see is that uh, glucagon generally is going to increase um, blood glucose concentrations, right? Uh, same with epinephrine and cortisol a little bit, not that much, but you'll see that glucagon has a big effect in the beginning, but then it kind of tapers off. Epinephrine, a little bit slower, but certainly an effect. And if you put both glucagon and epinephrine together, you get a bigger effect than if you just added these two together. And you put cortisol in there and a really large effect. Okay, so that's synergism. Um, you can also have what's called permissiveness. And permissiveness, what this means is uh, you now need a second hormone to get the full effect. So that second hormone may have absolutely nothing to do with, um, the, cons with the other hormone, but when you combine it, then it does. Uh, the cortisol effect here would be a good example of permissiveness. Um, so this permissiveness here, cortisol really doesn't change blood glucose levels much. But if you add it in to this, the glucagon epinephrine, um, you're going to see this really, really dramatic change that occurs. So this cortisol is permissive, as a permissiveness for glucagon and epinephrine. And then finally, you can have what's called antagonism, in which one substance opposes the action of another. So we have these um, competitive inhibitors that basically act as what we call functional antagonism. They bind to receptors and maybe they themselves have no effect. So you could have a, a competitive inhibitor of glucagon that binds to the receptors so that you don't have an increase in blood glucose level. Um, you also have, so glucagon and insulin, they themselves um, are, fu are functional antagonists in that glucagon increases blood glucose levels, but insulin would decrease blood glucose levels. So make sure you understand those hormone interactions. Okay, that's the end of this chapter. Again, make sure you go back and look at the study guide, go through the, the, um, the different learning objectives, take a look at the, the questions that you're gonna need to turn in, um, and uh, that then the, the case study should further reinforce some of these hormone um, especially the neurohormone uh, trophic cascades.